Hello, I'm Ignacio Estrada of uh, uh, LACNIC, and I'd like to invite the members of the panel for uh, co-sharing and the impact on the internet um, in this uh, panel. We are going to see how that could have um, an impact in co-sharing and uh, uh, so the, the chair will be Oscar Robles. I invite Oscar to come, the CEO of LACNIC. And in the panel, we're going to have Paul Bernardi, Senior Advisor of Policy and Advocacy of the Internet Society, Raul Echeverria, who will be um, remote, the Executive Director of LIFE, Christian Sanchez, Cristiani Sanchez, sorry, leader of the uh, Council of Administration of RING, and Gabriela Unailo, coordinator general of LACIX. Can you hear me? Okay, so thank you. Welcome. We are going to talk, as uh, Nacho said, we're going to talk about these initiatives that have been um, discussed for some months, some uh, uh, years, and essentially in parts outside of a region, a region. However, recently, they were also discussed in some parts of a region, uh, including the Caribbean, and even here in Brazil, we are talking about Fair share initiatives, sending palpes, and uh, basically the what they try to do. This translates in initiatives for the operators to charge the content generators for the excessive amount of traffic that users of these platforms um, use. That's in general terms what these initiatives uh, present. So we have a very interesting panel. Nacho already uh, introduced us. I want to thank the members of the panel for participating in this panel, for having accepted. And we it, it was also, we, uh, there was somebody of a, re we wanted somebody of the relevant operator to explain the situation. Twice they accepted and twice they canceled. So, to give a more objective point of view, we are going to present here what Fair Share is all about in the voice of the uh, people presenting these initiatives. So, if you can help me with uh, this presentation, it's just a couple of very simple slides. Here. So the, Europe, uh, the European telecom uh, companies, the uh, uh, et, uh, the this is a joint CEO statement of the European Telecommunications Network. So this reflects what they think is happening. In their view. Uh, these platforms monetize much of the traffic while the telecom companies have to invest to support that traffic. They consider that that model is not sustainable and they also think that the regulatory model or excessively regulated uh, model that is implemented in Europe also creates constraints to the telecom companies to charge the services of the large OTTs. Somehow, they, they well, they state that that is unequal in terms of investment. In the previous panel, you heard how things are changing, at least in the case of submarine cable, cables. Although it's not the, the entire infrastructure, it's a key part of telecommunications, and we saw how the large internet companies or the OTTs start playing a very significant role in those investments. What do these organizations propose, such as Etno and Telefonica? A direct compensation by the 
are OTTs, the large companies proposing solutions such as individual or collective negotiation directly between ISPs, telcos, and uh, the big platforms. Of course, it's not very clear who the big, two big uh, telcos or two big ISPs. Where do you have the cutting point? When do you start considering that they are a large platform, a large OTT, a large ISP, etc.? These are some of the questions that we would have liked to somebody to answer to see what is the impact of the initiatives that we mentioned. Another solution proposed is to make uh, to contribute to funds. Uh, a special fund or 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 else a digital tax although uh, the people that propose uh, this uh, uh, don't consider that this is the best choice so this is what we have that is our position i'm going to now we are no longer going to have any uh, slides so we we can uh, turn this off and we're going to now listen to the panel once again. I want to thank Paula Cristiani Daniel, and of course Raul via Zoom. Let us start precisely with Paula to my right. She represents the Internet Society and she's going to tell us about since they've uh, been monitoring uh, these initiatives for some time, not just in Latin America, but uh, across the world. We'd like her to tell us, give, to give us an introduction of this type of initiatives, of what they have identified, some of the characteristics of the, uh, these elements, to uh, help us understand. Yes, thank you, Oscar. Thank you for the invitation. I'm going to change to switch to Portuguese. So. Today, we are here to discuss those proposals. Oscar precisely started discussing the arguments that are used by the large telecom companies. The Internet Society has worked analyzing the potential impact of those uh, proposals in the interconnection, Internet interconnection model today. Here, I bring the global landscape. Let me start telling you about South Korea. One day, well, those uh, conversations are a bit more advanced in terms of the implementation. In uh, 2020, the Telecommunications Business Act, uh, Act uh, uh, is a law that says that ISPs should charge for the traffic they receive from others, that is, replacing the various peering uh, rules and the cost for content providers. In South Korea, they debate other bills that uh, uh, propose a different model, uh, offering contracts between content providers and ISPs and projects that uh, are anticipate blocking the OTTs both in in the country and abroad, and they that refuse to pay that network usage fee. So in the European Union. We accompanied the discussion of the uh, European Commission as an example of a different jurisdiction that uh, brings uh, up this uh, proposal more formally this year. They had uh, a public consultation the, uh, uh, early this year, the European Union, to adopt either the fair share or the uh, cost sharing. And the current plan that they have is to move forward in, uh, on the topic this year and next year. This proposal consists of a scheme of a, a network uh, usage uh, rate uh, or fee. Uh, Oscar said that we, we don't know what size the companies should have to pay the ISPs and uh, the uh, final OTTs. In Brazil, Anatel, that is the regulator, opened a subsidy chamber that is not such a formal process as a public consultation, but it's good to listen the, uh, uh, the community's feedback. So um, in uh, late July, we already had uh, the contributions and the regulator already 
uh, suggested bringing a proposal for public consultation planned for 2024. Both in Europe and in Brazil and in South Korea, we saw this uh, key argument that the regulation did not accompany the growth of uh, data traffic in the infrastructure of providers. And this would lead to the fact that, that it would imply a lot of expenses uh, for the telecom companies. What they complain about is that those companies with infrastructure are not authorized by uh, regulatory guidelines. They are not obliged to um, uh, um, uh, uh, charge those costs to the other agents of the chain. So we have to find uh, a way we can uh, strike a balance between them. So we see that this is seen as a way we develop the funding, uh, financing in the country through the capital of these large companies. Thank you. Um, that's excellent. Now, yes, uh, so we have the problem of defining the size. And one of the problems is that they say uh, fair sharing. But what do they share? Because in some proposals, they speak of sharing costs. But we, it is also understood that it would be it wouldn't make sense if a company only agreed of, chain, of sharing costs and not benefits. And probably there will be negotiations between sharing costs and sharing benefits, revenues, right? But this is not very clear either. So we are going to discuss this further on. So now let's talk to uh, Raul. Raul is a general manager of Ally, an association of uh, internet company suppliers, and they have both large companies and small companies. But now we'd like Raul to tell us what does Ally think as part of the organizations that uh, this message is addressed to Raul. Hello, good morning. My greetings to all of you there. I wish I could be with you, but unfortunately, I couldn't go to Fortaleza because this, uh, well, I was, I had to be somewhere else, but thank you for inviting me to participate remotely with so dear and respected colleagues. So as Paula said, much of this discussion is taking place in Europe. And I think that we must clearly understand that this is dis a discussion, an economic discussion, uh, competition and protectionism. There is no, it's no ch uh, chance. It's, well, the European uh, telecoms uh, are inherit the large uh, government owned uh, companies and Europe doesn't have big techs. Oh, they haven't in Europe. They're, we haven't seen the creation of many large OTTs. So there is a sort of uh, discussion between the European uh, telecoms and those of other regions. And the same applies to the discussions of the digital market, where the only companies that were included in the group of regulated companies, all are non-European. It's a small group. So that's something that cannot be debated we, we, unless we consider the context. Now, the clear thing is, well, this is a discussion that is based on old, obsolete um, uh, positions. I remember that 15 years ago, we, uh, with some of you there, we participated in this debate, and the arguments haven't changed much and even I think that they have lost ground because of uh, the evolution of the infrastructure of the internet but uh, they part um, of an old and uh, wrong uh, premise that it is that is that only the telecom companies are the only ones that add value to the uh, content uh, providers and not uh, both ways and clearly we can't give services on the internet unless you have the infrastructure but uh, what's the use of infrastructure if there's no content? So the two should uh, go hand in hand because they are intrinsically related. And the second premise is that apparently it's as if it were an old infrastructure where all the 
data circulated on infrastructure that belonged to the telcos, and that has changed uh, a lot. The, infrastru the uh, uh, infrastructure has changed with uh, the hundreds of uh, traffic speeds around the world, and I, I think that Gabriel is going to talk about that, and all the implementation of caches, both and the IXPs and within the infrastructure of the operators with the fiber optics that uh, have been built by the content, the OTTs and the data center. So there's an entire effort to develop infrastructure to make the contents closer and closer to users. So it's difficult to know when, how you could estimate the price of who is using whose services. And I think that the market has solved it very smartly today. More than 95% of the interconnections of peerings are informal and free of charge. That means that in real life, the different uh, stakeholders have accepted that it's a good thing and that it ad adds value to all the parties. Nobody does things uh, free of uh, charge um, uh, just to benefit others. They, they do it because they obtain a certain yield. So if you accept a regulation in the long term, that uh, regulation would convert to a situation that is similar to the current situation where they would again be compensating the benefits and cost of the party. So it, it would be an intervention in the market that would be unnecessary, but it would uh, be disruptive, especially harming the small operators that are the ones that would find it more difficult to reach agreements with uh, the big uh, companies. And it would uh, be a strong, uh, um, it, would, it would not encourage, uh, why would somebody bring a cash aid to an operator if you still have to pay for the uh, for using uh, consuming the data, I I'd rather have it. If I I want them to come and get it where I have the infrastructure without having to spend more. In the short term, I think that there would be a degradation of the quality of services. We would have to start a formal negotiation processes. It would take very long, and there's nothing negative. But I think that. Uh, it's, well, I think that uh, uh, they tell me that uh, they are not hearing you well. No, no, we can hear you perfectly well. So if there are any issues, just let me know, please. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. We can hear you perfectly well. So thank you very much for your words. We now continue. And we think that this dialogue only takes place among the bigger organizations and the major content provider companies. But these are not the only ones that are part of this. This is an ecosystem. We're all involved in it. And some of the major players, and there's a new player in Brazil, and these are the smaller access providers. We'll now would like to invite Christian to tell us what is the position of Abrint regarding these initiatives. Thank you, Oscar. It is a pleasure to be here. But I'm going to speak in Portuguese in order to facilitate understanding by all. So Abrint began this debate on fair share in the context of Global Digital Compact, which was an initiative of the I. OLO to discuss the ITO, sorry, regarding the future of telecommunications in the future from the standpoint of our print, which is currently the small provider association, which has more than 2,000 members in Brazil. We have divided this topic into several points. One is the one that Raul approached, which is the economic standpoint. Now, how the economic information we have on this sector justify or not some kind of regulatory, regulatory intervention on on prices. Another one has to do with the principles. In other words, how does the principle of network neutrality is or not associated to the fair share debate? A further quite important topic has to do with those the competitions regarding price setting, as is the case of fair share. So fair share has certain assumptions and depending on the fair share model. In some cases, we have 
origin of the traffic, and depending on the origin of traffic, we will then decide how to charge this. But regardless of that fact, and regardless also of the size of these enterprises, we understand that ultimately everything has to do with discrimination of traffic. So if there is a content provider company, whether small or large, this is not relevant because how this affects the peer agreements and the current internet infrastructure, this will occur. Nevertheless, this will have an impact on that. So Abrint has positioned itself together with the European Commission with a global digital product and also has a position regarding the Anatel subsidies situation. Now, this is quite a lively debate. Some arguments are in one direction or in the other. And a clear example is what Paula was telling us about South Korea. South Korea has a special situation regarding the origin of the regulation in Brazil. We have a standard whereby work is done on the neutrality concept in Article 9 of the Civil Code. In Korea, they don't have a standard or a regulation in this sense. They have principles. There's a key term that somehow led to issues in the debate regarding how to charge for this traffic. And this is SK Telecom and SK Broadcast. So in South Korea, they use the term reasonable. The term reasonable justifies any kind of network discrimination. This concept of reasonability does not exist in any other country. So as from arguments, technical arguments such as these of the context of the peering agreements and traffic, uh, transit, and the international routes that reflect how to charge and the origin of the traffic and in addition to these issues regarding the competences is where we prepared our contributions. One of the concepts is the concept of the markets on the two sides. We speak a lot about fair share in the context of this regulation. Abrint is in disagreement. It does not consider that this is related to a market everywhere, but this has to do with indirect network effects. For example, if I'm a Facebook customer or client and I use Facebook a lot, the trend would be for you to use that surface quite a lot. So that is an indirect network effect. This does not happen on the market on two sides. This is when you have two players and the two start with a positive price discrimination to sell a product or service. And that is not what is happening in the network infrastructure and the current way the internet works. We will be able to speak about this later, but this is the contribution we had for the time being. So thank you very much. The fact that you need a telecom operator, we would all agree on this because we all agree on the same line. But when we are speaking about the investment in the telecom networks and the efforts made so that the telecom networks can work better and have lower latency and deliver a product or experience that is more relevant for the users, in that case, we have the IXP. So here, we'd like to listen to Gabriela Donailo's comments, Gabriela Donailo's regarding his opinion regarding these initiatives regarding LAC IX. Gabriel, thank you, Oscar. I'd like to thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel and to celebrate initiatives such as these. Although this is a technical forum, it is important to discuss topics such as these that involve regulations which ultimately are likely to have an impact on the technological infrastructures. As Oscar was saying, I have to refer to the fair share debate from the standpoint of traffic exchange points. And I highlight the word debate because it is, in fact, a debate right now. This debate is taking place in Europe. And like Paula was saying, 
There's also a request for comments also here in Brazil on behalf of Anatel. So we are here at an instance of discussing all these topics. As you are aware, the IXPs are technological infrastructures that enable interconnection of two or more networks. And that is the definition, I'd like to say, three or more networks, because otherwise this would be traffic exchange or an interconnection, a private interconnection. Now, the traffic exchange points are crucial. They play crucial uh, roles, a crucial role like Oscar is saying, and also Raul. This then has the goal of reducing costs, particularly for IP transit, to improve quality of service. This due to the lower latency times, because this prevents traffic being guided through intermediate networks. It also proposes a resiliency scheme, and they are also flexible, or at least allow for resiliency and scalability in terms of traffic. Now, a proof of this is what we all experienced some years ago in the times of the pandemic, and also due to the lockouts that started taking place in different countries, so the traffic exchange points have been able to respond to traffic demands that increased in average by 35 percent in many parts of the world. And to be frank, I'm not aware of any IXP that did not suffer anything from that, and they were able to respond to this demand. Now, specifically going into the topic, that convenes us from the uh, traffic operators network. We think that fair share situations could lead to consequences. You might go from peering schemes that nowadays are done on a voluntary basis and that they are based on technical and strategic issues. We can go from there to a regulated scheme. At the same time, this might bring about the reduction or concentration of different players and the impact this would have on the cost of interconnection as well as a deterioration in the quality of service. The current peering market, the way we know it, seeks mainly to reduce costs. Nowadays, and Raul also referred to this, most of the agreements are settlement three. What does this mean? They do not pose costs for the connective parties or the parties that have such agreements. In fact, in 2021, BCH Packet Clearing House conducted a survey among 10,000 IXPs, and more than 99% responded that the peering agreements they have are settlement free. In other words, they don't pose any costs for the different parties, and this is very far from a regulated scheme. Now, all this has allowed us. And once again, as Oscar was saying, and also Raul, this has favored the development of infrastructures in the region and in the world. Now, specifically speaking about Latin America and the Caribbean, this has led to the development of new traffic exchange points in less than two years. Over this period, well, we conducted a study two years ago, which was now updated, and we have a 15 percent increase in new IXPs in this region. And this is not only the development, but this is also about strengthening the internet in general and the growth of those IXPs that already existed. Right now, we are celebrating this event in Brazil. We're holding this event in Brazil where we have 
the largest traffic point in the world. And as an Argentinian, I can hardly say the largest in the world in Brazil. I find it difficult as an Argentinian. But in terms of IXPs, you're great. But well, about soccer, we can discuss that. Who's better? Now, and Brazil towards the rest of the region, from the smallest to the largest ones, we have been able to promote interconnections such as these, which have only contributed to strengthening the internet in general. Now, going from a scheme such as this to a regulated framework will really set us apart from all the achievements we have managed to gain and would sort of be a step backwards in time. Thank you, Gabriel. Now, let us now go to a part of the session. We're going to ask for comments from the panels. And before we go, we go on to the questions, I'd like to reflect or comment and based on the opinion of the other panels or also anything that you'd like to add to your initial positions. We'll start with Paula. Thank you. Well, I think I will touch a point, a couple of points, because I would like to introduce the position of Internet Society regarding the public consultations in the European Union and Brazil. So maybe I will summarize some of the considerations. We have included seven points, which we understand has to do with these proposals that have an impact on the interconnection system in the internet the way we know it. First of all, we understand that these proposals change drastically and the basic premise of the internet model the way we know it today allow it to be the success it is. Secondly, these are incompatible with network neutrality. So these proposals precisely would be changing the right to deal with traffic in an autonomous way, the way it happens today in Brazil and in the civil framework and also with the concept of we have of internet. And this would lead to the risk of fragmentation. So we understand that as from the moment in which the IXPs have authorizations to block traffic, we are not creating a connected, open, and global internet, but we are rather generating a subset of network and services provided. And fourthly, these proposals leads to distorting the way communications take place because they are market driven. So today, this is not a market with only two players. Like Christiane was saying, there are different players that are contributing to this infrastructure. Now, fifthly, these proposals lead to having an inefficient infrastructure with high costs and a greater inequality. So this will result in worse services and have a poor quality for users globally. We see this happened in South Korea, where this option was implemented. So this regulation, in fact, will increase this and will prevent the, having that direct link between IXPs and content providers. Now, in the sixth place, the use of traffic volumes are inadequate and unfair metrics. Precisely these arguments use uh, metrics for measuring traffic, which we understand is something that varies a lot. And this depends on the network, on the customer base, the type of provider, the location of the local infrastructure of the technology used. And therefore, these are, this is not one single type of way to measure things globally. And finally, none of these proposals has benefits for the end consumers. Therefore, and thinking about the benefits for the end users, we realize that there are no benefits. So those are my, my comments. 
Now, there are a couple of points regarding this. If you are aware, the Internet Society and the relevance it has is that historically it has defended the technical principles of the Internet and with which the Internet was created. So the fact that there is no economic interest in this debate is most relevant because this gives us an informed position and a neutral position on this common issue. I will reflect on the points mentioned by Paula. It is not clear in this proposal what would occur if I don't pay the major operator. What would occur if I, if I don't comply with the desires? Will the traffic be regraded? Will the traffic be blocked? Like Paula was saying, I think it was in point number three, the risk for fragmentation. So those who decide not to pay for their contents, well, they provide transit for that. And if they're medium content generators or if they're non-for-profit content generators and the only thing they wish to do is to use the right to, for, of expression. So these are all relevant aspects that have an impact on the technical Internet principles that have allowed Internet to develop to the standard is today. And one of the other points I wanted to comment on is the final point, the benefit for end users. Ultimately, all these payments don't arise just from anywhere, all these mechanisms. Ultimately, there's one someone who's going to pay for this. It's the end user because they have to pay at the end of the entire chain for these services. So let us go on with the feedback from the panels. We'll go over to Raul. Are you there, Raul? Thank you, Oscar. Yes, you saved me in reacting to one of the points would occur if we, that would not happen. And quite clearly, the regulations such as these, as other colleagues mentioned, would lead to fast and slow routes in the internet and eventually this would lead to blocking which would have a very negative impact in terms of fragmentation of the internet. Now let us view this in practical terms. How do you imagine this might occur? Let us assume that a regulation is passed in Brazil that imposes payment to content providers. So if I represent and if I have to negotiate with one of those companies, I would tell the telecom communications, well, I won't bring this anymore so that you can have my data. Well, now you have to go and fetch your data. I don't know, for example, to the Las Americas in Miami and something else. Now, because this is more formal, because I have to pay in order to comply with the law, and of course we'll be complying with the law, then our peering agreement will now have to become formal. And it is likely that that will require involving the legal departments and it will take six months of negotiations to see what conditions are then carried forward. And then we have responsibilities. If you're listening, uh, Raul, we somehow lost you. Please let me know if we can rehab him. Uh, okay, there, there, he, there he is. We're, you're back. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we missed just the final, the last 30 seconds. I never stopped listening to you. I was saying, well, there will be responsibilities due to quality of service, data quality, but it is likely that my company will now say, well, peering will not be free. We have to add, assign values so if you charge for access to the network, I will charge for access to content. So ultimately, this will be a tie because, as I said, the market has already solved this. More than 99% of all peering agreements are free. And it is not because one is better than the other. This is because there is a benefit, uh, an agreement that benefits all sides. Now, what happens? Uh, what happened in the meantime? Users were affected by content that is closer or more reliable, and what Gabriel mentioned regarding the different advantages he stated, but in the long run, there will be solid agreements between the major content provider companies and the major telecoms. It will take some time and there will be agreements, but these are agreements that will benefit those parties. So after 
producing a sort of a distortion in the way the internet works. But what will happen with all the other ones, the ones you mentioned, Oscar, and ha the negative impact, and those who don't have access to the same type of agreements, and those who, whose negotiations will be asymmetrical between small operators and content providers or small content providers and the major telecom companies. So the conditions will be different. It will lead to market concentration. It will affect the smaller organizations and will also affect investments to attract caches to the IXPs and to do peering with the IXPs. So this is a distortion which will not benefit the telecom companies and if they if they expect that to be the case, but this will be a process that will be quite painful along the way for the different stakeholders. Thank you, Raul. So we now continue with Christian. When we imagine a market like the Brazilian market, we're speaking about eight, over 800 ASs. We can see how much the fair share model affects the entire system. This fair share model is understood as a regulatory intervention of a cross subsidy which is forced. It is imposed because it establishes price conditions and also price discrimination which is meaningless in order to maintain the entire system. Whenever we think about network neutrality, we have to think that price regulation and prioritization of traffic are problems for the principle of neutrality. Even the REC, when it issued a decision in response to the European Commission, stating that price discrimination was a form of discrimination, this was a positive response. So this, this takes us back to the origin of the debate on the TCP IP protocol at that time. At the end of the 90s, a protocol was placed, X25. This protocol had a major difference with the TCP IP, which prioritized packets. This concept of non-discrimination stems from that time, and it is meaningful to maintain the system the way we know it today. A further important aspect are the investments made in the network, the volume of CDNs and of investments made by the content providers is very relevant, very important. It grows from year to year. It grows far more than what had been forecasted in the sense of the increase of investments in communications. There was a leap in terms of traffic during the pandemic and also a leap of investment over that period. Afterwards, the investment level sort of became stable. So that is the trend. This is a trend from now into 10 years. Investing in mobile networks is higher. And this because of the increase in 5G. But this is not the case for fixed networks. So the big debate about fair share, once again, is an issue of competence, competition for fixed networks. This is something that we should not lose sight of. We have to understand why this topic after 2012, when this discussion first took place, is now coming back to the debate. So, Gabriel, now with your reaction. Yes, I would like to add on that what Raul was saying regarding the legal aspects of going over to a framework with regulated peering framework and how this would involve the work of lawyers. When he's referred to the settlement free peering, this percentage is related to a handshake. These are agreements where you just shake hands between the different sides without that bias of formality where lawyers step in. 
and agreements are signed. Now, I'd like to add on to what Paula was saying and also Raul. Paula regarding South Korea and Raul, who was saying that we'll then have to go and fetch content outside. This is happening in South Korea and somehow peering content is being held in Japan and not in South Korea. In some cases, this is quite relevant. These interconnections are taking place outside the country. You have the infrastructure in the country. It's not growing. There is loss of competitiveness because of the concentration of players. And this is the impact that they are having after reviewing the interconnection policy in 2016. I think the microphone isn't working very well. So these are some of the big examples. We're seeing some big negative examples that invite us to reflect on this topic and to think what we should do and how we want to proceed. Thank you. So now let us go over to the questions. I see we have a list of patient participants queuing up on the microphone. Now, we're going to start with a question from the virtual forum. No questions? OK. So if you can help me with some of the lights and the public, because I'm sort of blind up here, cannot distinguish who's queuing up. Ariel, Ariel, please state your name and your organization. I'm Ariel Greiser from Argentina. For more than 30 years, I am, have been an ISP. And I have first a reflection that I'd like to make and then a question. My reflection is this model that I see reminds me of the internet 20 years ago with the level of concentration and with the level of discrimination regarding whom I connect to and whom we have to pay to access content. And this is what was happening 20 years ago. Over the past 20 years, I have worked on trying to make internet decentralized and distributed. And part of that success was being able to obtain the caches for the majority of the ISPs, particularly in Latin America. In Brazil, there are more than 20,000. In Argentina, there are more than 2,500. Now, the first question I would like to ask is, I'm asking myself this, and I think this was mentioned in the panel, who is going to select this, and how will the process be so that all ISPs can have equal conditions? Thank you, Ariel, who would like to react to that comment or question. I'm not going to answer that question. So I'm going to switch to Portuguese now, she says. Now, the decision making in the uh, subsidy adoption in Brazil is about how to regulate things, who regulates, and how will that regulation be done. So I'm not in a position, I'm not up to date with that discussion in order to determine how that decision will be made. We still don't have an answer to that from the regulators. We saw part of this in South Korea and coming from the ministry, but it is not so clear which will be the next steps. So thank you. Next, Aristoteles. Good morning. I'm Aristoteles Dantas. I'm in the, I've been in the internet industry for almost 20 years, and I have a couple of reflections to make, and then a question. And these are some of those rhetoric questions and what is happening in the Brazilian market particularly. We have thousands of autonomous systems, more than 20,000 smaller and larger providers, and I was yesterday analyzing public information on those companies, companies that lead the implementation of that movement. And I realized that one of these had revenues of more than 
compared to the previous year. A second one had a 10% revenue compared to the previous year for the same period. And finally, those other companies that say that they have very high investment costs. Now, the numbers I mentioned previously are net earnings. So a company that says that they invest uh, uh, money considering the high level of traffic and have 50% earnings higher compared to the previous year. Well, we are aware, well, we had the pandemic and after the pandemic, the growth of traffic sort of balanced out. Now, the relevance of what is happening in the internet in Brazil, building larger networks, popularizing access to broadband, was the initial kickoff to achieve real digital inclusion. So I was tried to study how many people are not connected in the world. And this is a number that is over 2 billion people. So if this is enormously relevant. And we see that this is something that really goes against that request because they're not seeking to balance the different sides. So how could we really discriminate things? A bit is still a bit when it goes through the network. At a moment, to have strategic uh, differentiation, the companies who claim things such as these say, well, access this content when you buy my plan, and this will be at zero cost. This is because they thought they would have new and additional income. But now, after the imbalance that took place during the pandemic, they want to apply new rules to become even more profitable. And this will not only affect end users, which are all of us, but also the smaller companies that today are trying to conquer their own space in the labor market. Small and medium-sized enterprises in Brazil are the ones that generate more jobs. And they really apply digital inclusion. I will stop here and I will give the floor back to you who have posed these topics. So, so this is uh, back, back to you with this question. What efforts will be required by the internet community? What efforts can we all make? What can we all do jointly to prevent that situation to be included in our conversations, considering the progress made by some of the people of the power and who are highly relevant? show that they are in favor of adopting measures such as these. And I understand, I humbly understand that this is very harmful, not only for a small internet provider in Latin America and in Brazil, but for all internet users because of the discrimination. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to react to that question made by Aristoteles? Regarding that question, there are very technical arguments. And when we leave a forum such as this and we go out to speak those who are discussing public policies, it then it is quite difficult. We have we find it difficult to convey what we understand. Now there is an important feature in that debate, namely the capacity to make people have full access to content regardless of this coming from a major content provider or not. These arguments can be used to convey this to people who have access to networks. So we can limit this but through price discrimination, we are affecting certain segments of the population with lesser resources. So if we think that this is the capacity of including many people from the social standpoint and to allow them to have content to the internet, well, all this favors the debate. Regarding Ariel's question, 
one of the important points is that we need to claim for the access to CDN and the conditions of CDN regardless of who owns the content. The fact that this content is closer is a way of democratizing access and guaranteeing better quality. So I'd like to congratulate the person who made the first question based on that because this highlights the relevance of highlighting access regardless of the negotiation capacity of the provider. Thank you very much, Christiane. There's a challenge that we can be sensitive to, uh, not, not necessarily the solution, but the challenges that some telecom operators are facing. You may have heard that these proposals uh, uh, appeared uh, in uh, Europe, uh, high-income countries, uh, with high revenue per user in those telecom uh, companies, densely populated uh, places, common regulatory frameworks. However, if we go to a place that doesn't have those conditions, like as the Caribbean, where they have low income, technologically, uh, they, they, we are not speaking uh, of uh, the uh, communities more prone to adopt those technologies, scattered places with a low density of population, and on top of that, different regulatory frameworks, uh, definitely they have a challenge. It doesn't mean that the way they solve it needs to be that, but when we see the challenge of these operators and the countries to uh, cover telecom uh, uh, to provide telecom coverages. I think that proposals like this will have more resonance than in our countries, where indeed we have solved the connectivity in, uh, with very different solutions. So it is there that those initiatives will have uh, uh, more um, chances than in other countries. It's just so that you may consider those uh, financial um, um, differences. Maya, no questions from the forum. In, uh, my name is Warner Maya, and I am part of uh, the board of LACNIC. However, I want to clearly state that my comment uh, does not represent the position of uh, the uh, uh, organization, but mine as an operator, because I've been an operator since uh, the inter commercial internet started in Brazil. Some uh, of uh, uh, I've been working with the some uh, figures of the internet in Brazil, and um, although more shallowly, I studied that of uh, uh, the economy, the economy of other countries in the region. First of all, I think that this debate is not a new debate. Um, more recently, uh, well, it, we've changed the name and now we call it fair share, but this debate was already there 10 or 12 years ago when we talked about uh, network neutrality because as Christian said very well, this debate has to do with a change on how we are uh, handling the internet or manipulating the internet at present. There are some figures uh, uh, that are very relevant. Let me quote the figures of Brazil. Now speaking, uh, now I, I understand and I know that these figures are more or less uh, similar in Argentina and other countries in the region too. In many uh, cases, the countries of the region follow a similar model. At present in Brazil, we have the second largest ASs in the world, 33% uh, connection, uh, broadband uh, connection with fiber optic that uh, are being offered by uh, small operators. So. More than half of the broadband connections in Brazil are not provided by the large telecom companies, but by small providers. And, and why did this happen like this? Well, because I think that because of governance, 
issues implemented uh, uh, the governance model implemented in uh, Brazil. I, I, I'm speaking of a free and open governance model where there's a managing a committee. And here we have Professor Lanzaro, who was already there at the beginning of this story. And uh, he can also uh, um, and, uh, talk about uh, this uh, model of governance. So there's a flexibility that enables the existence of small providers. These small providers today re represent 53% of fiber optic connectivity in Brazil. And that has to do only with uh, the uh, numbers declared in Anatel. And precisely because of a lack of control and organization, we think that this figure is lower than what exists in terms of broadband. Uh, Brazil has more than 5,000 municipalities, and all of them have at least one broadband operator. Most of them have more, but at least one provides broadband uh, fiber optic uh, connectivity to the, to the clients. Uh, home and that that is due to the model that we have implemented in Brazil in a flexible manner that made that access possible the fair share somehow uh, it, it it was it's all it, it was called fair share in the past and that uh, jeopardizes the prevalence of this model so I'd like to uh, hear this uh, panel I'd like some representative. We, I'd love to have a representative of a, one of those big companies that defend the fair share and that do things that are quite uh, heavy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the lawmakers to implement this new concept. I would like to have a representative of more than one representative connected to this area to ask them a question. So, uh, sometimes in the IET, we accompany IETF forums, and this is quite a classic question when there are new proposals. What type of problems do we want to solve? What type of problems do these companies want to solve? Aristotle, uh, uh, Aristotle is, uh, uh, very well uh, said that the gain of the profit of that obtained by these companies that defend a fair share are huge. I have real figures. One of them receives more than one billion in a quarter. So this is the real thing. And what's the problem that this company wants to solve to increase the gains in three months? I I see that, well, we, uh, I, th I think that, well, today I, I don't have a direct question for the members of the panel, but rather it, it's, it's a comment because I'd like to have the opportunity to challenge them directly, to ask them what is the problem, what is defended by these companies, uh, what are the problems that uh, these problems that defend a fair share? I, I'd like, I'd love to have that kind of problems. Thank you, uh, thank you, Maya. I don't see very well, but I, who's there? And uh, uh, could you give your name, Marcelio, of Lac Ixp? It's difficult to speak. I'm going to speak Portuguese. It's difficult to, to speak uh, after so many people because they have said things that I wanted to, uh, to mention too. Now, the problem of fair share is that's not the name it should have. It should be unfair share because there's nothing fair about this story. But it's a false problem. This problem actually doesn't exist, and we know that. We are all in the, we've all been on the internet for a long time, and we know that this problem was already solved. In 2012, 
I was at the ITO. Maya was with me. We were working on the network neutrality agreement, and this problem was arising. As a matter of fact, I remember that there was an ITO uh, um, uh, meeting in Dubai, and we we were discussing the neutrality of the internet, and it was only starting at the time. But since then, the internet has evolved a lot. The connectivity has evolved a lot, and the connections were strengthened. And today, the content is essentially in uh, the borders. It's no longer centralized in the internet. That we don't, uh, we no longer have the need that we used to have 10 or 20 years ago about this connection problem. Therefore, this is a false problem. And as Maya said, really, I need, I, we should have here a person uh, connect, uh, representing the big companies or even Anatel. Anatel should be here. So, and there's also a coincidence that less than an hour ago, there was an identical panel in uh, Futurecom, uh, speaking of fair share, just with uh, telecom operations. So they are just uh, trying to avoid this dialogue precisely with the people that know about the internet in Brazil. We all know what uh, tele thing is. So those in the area of telecommunications speak of the internet, but they should come and talk to us because we are the ones that know how the internet works and what won't work. So what happened in South Korea is a clear example of what should not happen. And why does that happen? Because there they prepare, they um, uh, they applied fair share, the traffic moved to Japan, and we just heard uh, the news that a big operator decided to start paying Netflix, something like that. So let's see. There's an operator that had an agreement in Brazil. We have 20,000 small operators own only four large operators. If four large operators sign agreements with these small uh, OTTs, who, what will happen? So this issue of the agreements reflect uh, an old uh, vision of the world, a centralized world, a world where telecommunications were a monopoly. So really, they should participate in this event, or we should participate in their events to bring uh, this uh, to the table. So, but finally, to uh, wrapping up my um, I would like to tell you that to all effects, this is a false argument. There is no reason at all why we should approach this uh, issue of content distribution. And there's something that uh, Raul mentioned uh, very wisely. I'm, I've been a provider for 27 or 28 years. And I remember very well that when I started, we had internet uh, dialing. And I was a bit worried. I thought that it would be just a fad. And I had no idea what the internet would become. And I wasn't worried about the lack of contents. I, what I was afraid of as a provider was that there wouldn't be enough contents in the internet and that the users would end up canceling the service because there would be nothing to see. That was what 28 years ago I was afraid of. But that, now things have changed. Absolutely, there's no content if we don't have connectivity. And we don't connectivity, we wouldn't have contents. If today we didn't have all the create content creators, the big OTTs, then we up to today uh, we wouldn't have the same thing. We would have access to dialed internet up to today and email exchanging messages and an access equivalent to the past. And all these capacities that we have today are precisely due to contents because. Uh, Otherwise, connectivity, 5G con, uh, connectivity wouldn't exist if we ha didn't have the contents that we have. Two, we could keep 2G. So one thing is related to the other. 
This is a vision of having economic gains, and there's no other way of describing what is happening. There is no way of describing what is happening. You won't escape this debate because it was likely that you will take this debate to them. So thank you very much. How many people, people do you have in the queue? There are three more. So we have questions. So let us maintain the queue of participants. So this is to, we have the queue of people at the microphone, Nacho? Okay, go ahead. So, all right, to start closing and to allow the members of the panels to make some final questions, uh, reflections, sorry, I'd like you to be brief with your questions. Good afternoon, I'm Mayara Figueiredo. I'm a journalist in Brazil for a journal. We cover telecommunications and the digital market in, the, in Latin America. I'd like to ask Christiane a question. I read your uh, reaction to the subsidies and Anatel, but in addition to this issue about the cost distribution and among the big techs, we also have the bill that is being processed in the House of Representatives, which MPL 2668, by the representative Joe Meyer, who wants to speak, refers to this topic. Could you please make comments on whether this falls within the scope of Anatel, and if Anatel is somehow in that position that they're ready to regulate the big techs, and how can we tackle this if the regulating agency has that position, and also if there are conditions to regulate the big techs? What is your opinion in that sense? Okay, thank you. Christiane, you have the floor. Thank you for your question. Now, these topics are related to one another, and that is the problem. We try to see, it's not the same to discuss fair share or like Basilio was saying, the other issue. Now, we have an issue of competence and competition in Brazil. What we see around the world is that the world is taking the discussion of the internet to the core of telecommunications. This was done now. Now, this was incorporated now, recovering the concept of neutrality and taking internet. This was done in India, too, positioning internet in the telecommunications. And in Brazil, the subsidy taking mixes up different topics, including that of competition and the internet. We speak about fair share, we're speaking about price regulation. This is of the interest for the internet, not in a positive way, but in a negative way. From the standpoint of competition and lack of information and analysis and moderation of content, this is a different discussion. I understand that there are other paths that we can follow in addition to Anatel. These are different debates. Abrint stated its position publicly in that context regarding the lack of information, but this is not related to the fair share discussion. I don't think this answers your question. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Fernando Frediani. I'd like to make a comment on something that one of the members of the panel referred to, and this is a civil framework of the internet. I like to study things, and I interpret the civilian network uh, framework, sorry. This type of discussion doesn't violate the civilian framework regarding degradation of traffic, because degradation of traffic is produced eventually by saturating the interconnection capacity between companies that distribute traffic and send these to their clients. So this is a business decision. This is a commercial decision. The telecom company has the capacity of deciding if they don't wish to update something, they might not host a 
uh, server in general, OTT server, and this will affect the organization. This affects the company's own interest. So this is no longer producing a degradation the service, as is mentioned by the civil regulation. This would occur if traffic would be prioritized over another type of traffic. So simply, one could decide to do updates or not, or to make a significant investment to balance out that situation. If that is not done, they will be affected by it. So I think this has nothing to do with the civilian network. Now, the second point is the access provider. I know that some telecom managers don't like to listen to this, but their role is to transport bits. And if there is heavier content that is sold to the user, well, that larger type of content somehow has to be taken to those users. If they purchase this plan, they should be able to deliver that service. If they don't, the numbers don't really work out, they have to adjust the fee paid by the users. Maybe these are not the adequate levels. And the final point is simply to reinforce what many stated earlier. And it's quite curious. I see that there are no smaller providers that are complaining about this. It is the larger providers that are complaining. I understand that the larger providers have a universe that is thousands times larger than the smaller providers with traffic volumes that are very big, very high cost. But they also have a customer base that is high and they have large income in order to deal with all those issues. Everything is an issue of proportion, business as usual. So we really have to find a solution to the problem by charging the adequate values to customers who wish to have that content and not to charge from those who distribute content in the internet. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Frediani. Raul, you like, would like to make comments on that? Thank you, Oscar. Not specifically to the comments made by Mr. Frediani, but many other things. And if you allow me to go very fast, because there were many very interesting contributions made in this exchange. Simply something that mentioned was mentioned by Ariel, and how can we ensure access to all the agreements by the different operators. What we're used to seeing is that when regulations are bad and have their voids, then regulations try to make this up through more regulations. Those have more regulations that will try to figure out solutions to the current regulation with a kind of over-regulation, which is highly undesirable. Now, Cristiani referred to the importance of access to the CDNs. This is very important. This is something that we have to continue working on with that community that is gathered together in Fortaleza. They have all worked intensively in improving the infrastructure in Brazil. The work they have done through NIC Brazil with the PBT project is really admir admirable. We have to have, it's good if they can continue working along those lines. And what you said, Carlos, happening in the Caribe, this is very important. There is a discussion uh, at present. We were invited to participate in Trinidad and Tobago with the telecom authorities. We submitted our comments there. We presented our comments there. And I think precisely this is where we need to have more collaboration, not more regulation, but more collaboration in order to bring contents closer and increase the possibilities of providing better services to the users. I think that is the approach that would be required. Maya asked what was the issue. Well, my, in my first um, uh, the first time we took the floor, I said, well, this is meaningful in Europe. This does not mean that it's good, but it is meaningful. But we, what they wish to do is to share, sh solve a problem involving competition. They want to have subsidies from the North American or Chinese industry to improve the European infrastructure. This is a situation that for them in Europe might be meaningful, but it's not meaningful in Latin America. And this is something that we have to underscore. These are different situations. These are different realities. We have a vibrant and innovating ecosystem that is quite different from the situation they have in Europe today. 
And one of the things that Basilio was saying, I think this is very important, he was, who's going to negotiate with the 20,000 plus. And we don't have to underestimate, and this was mentioned also by Gabriel, these current agreements, these informal agreements are highly valuable. So to dedicate legal capacities, try to figure out solutions to 20,000 situations is something that is impossible to think of. So that is why prioritization will have to take place regarding the agreements with the major operators, both content providers and telcos. Um, Basilio is perfectly right. This is a very important point. And Frediani was saying that this does not lead to degradation, but I disagree. I think that precisely, and also some of the colleagues highlighted this in the panel, this would lead to uh, discrimination in terms of agreements, and this will lead to degradation of services. So if I have to prioritize things, I will prioritize the packets with those with whom I have better agreements or with those I have agreements at all compared to those which we don't have agreements. So this will lead to degradation, at least in the short term. I would love to express my opinion also on the Bill 27678 in which we were also involved in the discussions. But let me just say that we clearly stated our position that we do not agree with having a uh, supra-regulator that regulates all issues related to the digital issues. This is power concentration. And the different types of areas that require regulation require different strategies, not personal data protection compared to protecting competition, moderating contents, and spectrum regulation. These are areas that are totally different. They require totally different standpoints and skills. Thank you very much. And I reacted to many things at the same time in order to save time. Thank you, Raul. So now let us go back to the final questions. You have 30 seconds and the two remaining questions directly, and then maybe final reflections. Good afternoon. I'm David Armando. I'm from Colombia. I represent uh, ISP group in Colombia. And this is a comment. The comment is that we, the smaller companies, are those that connect those who are left over and the major once become larger and larger. We knock on the doors of NNs and they just ignore us. In Colombia, we pay access to the dedicated internet at a very high rate. So the major ones start stifling us more and more. And the smaller ISPs who do provide connections to those who are nobody interested in, we reach out to the, the places where they cannot reach. They now realized that that is a market niche that is most interested and they are now reaching to where we have reached. So my reflection is we're going to disappear. In Colombia, we are going to disappear. And the agreements between themselves are so easy. They knock on each other's doors and they sign the agreements the large agreements between one another. And we're just being left outside. That was my reflection. Thank you. Yes. I'm Carlos Teiras, and basically, I represent users. 30 years ago, I read an article where it stated that the earnings are the result of the service, and this is what is happening. I think that earning money is based on the services. The infrastructure companies haven't had the possibility of changing their business model because in the past they controlled the services and now they don't no longer do so. So I think this is an economic issue. And finally, the issue regarding control, at least in Latin America, I think this won't work because the only thing that will happen here is to make things more expensive for users. So my question is to the members of the panels or who agrees with me. Thank you. So we now close the quest the Q and A session, and we'd li like to ask for a final reflection. Let us start with Gabriel. Final comments. I think that silence is an enemy in this process. Someone who was asking questions was, well, what can we do? Well, we have to speak out. This is positive. Name it to 
disseminate these ideas to raise the awareness. And at LACIX, we launched this year a group on public policies. And this was launched mainly in order to start discussing this topic. That we can discuss further topics. But this year, we have had three sessions with members from the IXPs with a profile more focused on public policies. We also integrated LACNIC and the Internet Society in this discussion. And we had a session with an advisor on public policies from the European Union. We also had sessions with a major content provider who told us about the issues they are discussing. We're also involved in what is happening simultaneously in the four regions that are part of the traffic exchange policy. Federation together with our peers from Europe, Africa, and Asia. With them, we are up to date on the latest things that are happening in each of those regions. So what do we have to do? Well, to pay attention and to participate in forums such as these and make ourselves heard. I think that to wrap up, the last question raises the economic point and that of competition. We're speaking about a telecommunications market. And the last, they'll have a margin above 40%. We have, when we see a market of that size and the investment of opportunities, all that conversation sort of gets lost and is no longer meaningful. As soon as we start discussing public policies, we have to have technical arguments and clarity on some of the concepts. We have to deal with price discrimination as an offense, the civil framework of the internet as well. And then we have to continue discussing this topic. This began back in 2012, and like was mentioned by Maya and other speakers. And now we have this new debate that is taking place in FCC and in India. So these are the things that we have to pay attention to and understand that this is a very relevant debate. And the presence of people who have a different vision is also very useful in order to improve and to better understand how the debate should take place daily to improve the ecosystem we have today. Now, I think that my comments also have to do with this point. We heard already about something similar in some of the people who took the floor. And we're speaking about the needs that some sectors have and that are not present today here. But this does not mean that we're not discussing things with them in other spaces. So that search for dialogue is present. And I'm speaking on behalf of the Internet Society. This is a neutral organization and works to maintain global, connected, and secure internet. We have worked to present these technical arguments to the experts. We also work with Internet Society's chapter in Brazil in order to have an awareness raising campaign among users who are those who will be suffering from the impact in the event of approving proposals such as these. This campaign is called Toll Peaje in the networks, and we work with a chapter with, in Brazil, we have a website in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. There we have a compilation of technical and non-technical information. So I invite those of you who are interested to participate in that debate, to ask questions, and to become involved. So I don't want to extend the time prior to lunch. So let us close. I'd like to thank Paula from Internet Society, Raul from Alai, Christian, and Gabriel, for your experiences and most valuable comments. Thank you very much. And we resume after lunch. Thank you.